in the ancient Greek, one of the translations of the word Peebles is town without traffic lights. <laughs> and it was a point of pride in Peebles for nearly 3,000 years that this town had no traffic lights and that people crossed safely from one side of the high street to the other. But earlier this year, Scottish, Scottish Borders Council decided that the people of Peebles are no longer competent to cross the road on their own. And so these monstrosities were installed on Peebles High Street. An institution that's been here for nearly, uh, well, for over 400 years. Um, it's a great institution in Scotland and it started right here in Peebles. And it's behind you, Greg's. <laughs> Greg's was established here in 1540. If you come down here at 10 past 1 on any weekday during term time, you'll find a long line of black uniforms going all the way down the street here, queuing up for Greg's goods. Because, as everybody knows, a sausage roll from Greg's stays with you longer than most foods do. <laughs> we are standing in a very important part of the town here because it is the junction of the high street going down there the north gate going there and there and here we have the east gate and at the junction of these three is this very important Mercat cross which is probably the oldest piece of street furniture in the whole of Peebles. It wasn't just a market which would take place at the Mercat cross it was also used for the announcements of important um, things which happened in the country like there was a new king or, a, or the king had died and um, all sorts of news like that but it was also a place where justice if you had committed minor misdemeanors, you would have to, and found guilty, of course, you would have to stand at the Market Cross with a sign around your neck for the whole of the day. And people may or may not throw rotten tomatoes at you. Now, Mr. Tall has got some typical sort of charges. <laughs> we thought it would be a good idea to try and enact this out and try and make, just to drive it home a little bit of what really would have happened. So this is a street urchin we've got here, is it? There's a street urchin. Here what I charged with making the riot upon Mrs. Spencer in the biggies now. Willful damages upon Mr. Lowe's sheep fence and impugning the name of the Reverend Macmillan in a loud voice after the midnight bells. And to stand all day at the Market Cross next market day. The sign would be then put around his neck. Which is pretty pointless really because most of the people were illiterate but, but they would get the idea that oh dear there's another chap doing what he shouldn't have done <laughs> and being made to stand at the Merkel Cross. <laughs> Typical sort of street urchin of the time. You can't take a tour of Peebles without visiting one of Peebles great institutions. For sites. The Forsyth's family arrived in Peebles in Neolithic times and they started trading uh, strips of dried antelope and bear meat uh, for local goods and uh, they've been here ever since. It was, uh, it was a thriving trade and in fact they still uh, to this day uh, trade uh, meat products uh, for local currency. One of the great features of uh, Peebles life is the Forsyth's queue twice as long purchasing your meat as you do in any other store uh, and this ensures that a lot of people are, are waiting outside uh, with, uh, with saliva building in their mouths. The other um, uh, technique they have is that all of the meat that's actually for sale is stored in a refrigerator at the far end of the shop. Uh, so when you go in and you ask for, uh, for your sausages or your, or your pork links that are right there, they will in fact go all the way down to the end of the shop to get them. Uh, and uh, most of you will have had that experience. Um, you can see the two, the two faces of Waldorf and Statler, who are the two <laughs> old men from the Muppets, who uh, look down and remark on each of the performances. And they were put up there way back in the early 19th century uh, to look down and remark on what was going on in the town. Yes, long before the Muppets came Long, long before the Muppets, yes, yes, yes. So they would say things like, what, what was that? That was rubbish! That was terrible! That was very strange! It was oddly amusing! It was rather funny! Well, it was incredibly funny! It was brilliant! We loved it! <laughs> more! <laughs> more! 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 Here we are again at uh, Beaches. This is the famous Beaches building. Um, and it's a great institution in Peebles, but it's closed. And it has been closed for some time. Now, before it was closed, it was the premier outfitters and haberdashers uh, in the area. Um, it had been for generations. Uh, it's a beautiful building and 
uh, Mr. Beach, in fact, started his business, as we can see from the little sign here, in 1884, uh, he established his haberdashers and uh, men's outfitters. What we can also see up here is that the building wasn't finished until 1885. Mr. Beach, unfortunately, was the victim of local builders who promised him that they would be in by Christmas, but, in fact, he won't end until the following year. You know, when John Veach told me of what his plans were for his new outfitters and haberdashery on the corner of, of the High Street and the North Gate, I thought he was mad. With no experience and no professional training, all he had was a desire, a vision, to see this building built on the corner of these two streets. And like Saul on the road to Damascus, he was determined to see it through. The most audacious thing, of course, are these turrets strutting forward rampant into the street, into the North Gate and the East Gate. And there, in the window, is curved glass. It was a ridiculous thing to try and build. You know, when you add all these features together, and the curved windows, the turrets, and the stone uh, chicken, it all comes together to form this amazing edifice which we see today. I thought he was crazy, but now I look back at it, I think it works. <laughs> Beach was the victim of something that afflicted quite a number of people's tradesmen. The clues in the name. The apostrophe. And we'll be seeing as we move on in our tour the reason for this. A whole generation of people's tradesmen had a problem. To Coburn's School for Boys. <laughs> One can only imagine what the English lessons were like from Dr. Coburn. Dr. Coburn's School for Boys was one of many uh, small schools uh, that operated in Peebles. Peebles has a proud history of education going right back to the 1400s and many of the schools were like this one. Uh, they were held uh, in somebody's living room uh, and perhaps only had five or six pupils who all paid a small amount uh, each, each term or, 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 or week to come along. Uh, there were also schools which were funded by the borough. Uh, and some of these were in uh, slightly larger buildings that were rented uh, for the purpose. Um, but you can immediately uh, see the problem here with Dr. Coburn's School for Boys. There's that extra apostrophe which makes all the difference. And Dr. Coburn clearly had no understanding of what uh, the apostrophe meant. Uh, as you can see, just to... Just to there it is quite clearly now. Quite clearly there. And, um, of course, many of these boys went on um, to set up businesses in the town. Um, Mr. Smale, for instance, from uh, Inner uh, set up his, uh, his news agents. Uh, who's, uh, who's heard of Finlayson's Builders' Yard nowadays? The uh, Taylor's Taylor's. Taylor's Taylor's. Particularly difficult one, that one. Yeah. And uh, I'm equally closed nowadays is people's railway station. Very confusing. <laughs> yeah. A great landmark in, in Peebles, the Tontine Hotel, uh, built in 1808, uh, again with the help of French prisoners of war uh, giving labour to this thing. But why the Tontine is, is, is known in Peebles is, is not because of its building, but because of the way it was financed. Uh, it was financed uh, using a principle called the Tontine Principle. This was a financial instrument uh, which uh, operated, it, it allowed a number of people to group together and pay for uh, a business. And that business then belonged to all of them. And as each partner died, their part of the business was redistributed amongst the others until eventually there was only one left who inherited it. You can see the problem, can't you? As tontines went out of fashion uh, in the kind of mid-19th century, so they, they went around. But uh, recently the uh, Royal Bank of Scotland uh, was offering its tontine mortgage. Uh, and people were initially interested until someone discovered that Fred Goodwin's name was actually written into every
every single one of these, ah. uh, these tontines. Uh, and so they've gone now altogether. But happily, the Tontine Hotel uh, goes on. It's very popular. Very nice for afternoon tea, isn't it, uh, so, uh, isn't yes. it Mr. Yeah, Tour? It's gone. Yes. Yeah. No recent visit to Peebles is complete, of course, without a visit to our golden post box. This post box was until very recently the traditional red, but was painted gold to celebrate the fact that one of the local builders finally completed his contract on time. <laughs> this was an initiative which was set up by the Scottish Builders Federation uh, and uh, is nationwide and it's been rolled out. So sadly there are none of these near the Parliament building in Edinburgh or anywhere near the tram tracks in Edinburgh as well. Yeah. Yes, I think that's for you. That was a reason, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that, that yeah, was, the reason, that was yes. the reason. And apparently people are now chipping away little bits of this gold to take away uh, a souvenir. Souvenir for hunters, unfortunately, quite a problem in Peebles, as we'll be seeing later on. And it won't be long before this is returned to its original red, I think. So, uh, let's continue let's down, please. Down the street and go somewhere quiet. Well done with that sign, man. Shall I relieve you of it? Yes, thank and you. Pass that on to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. You gather yourselves in the centre of the courtyard there. Oh, sorry, man. I'll pass on to you. Is that the first time you've had it? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Right. We like to pass things around. But this is called Parliament Square, and the official record is that it's perhaps because there was a meeting of the Scottish Parliament in here in 1346. Perhaps, perhaps not. But anyway, it followed a battle in Durham when King David II was taken prisoner. And there was an emergency meeting of the Scottish Parliament here. Now, Mr. Tall and I think that's rather odd because this is a long way from Durham. Why didn't they have their emergency meeting in Colt Street or Kelso or Gala Shields? Or why did they wait until they got here? Other people think that the reason it's called Parliament Square was to celebrate the union between Scotland and England in 1707. But why on earth it's not called Union Square rather than Parliament Square, I don't know. And I guess it doesn't really matter. What is important about this square here is this building here. Because this is where the other half of that famous music hall act, which Mr. Tall mentioned earlier, which also moonlighted as a body-stealing duet in the evening, this is where Mr. Burke lived. Mr. Burke was of Irish descent and uh, was a labourer who moved around it. and worked here for a while working on the harvest. And he did achieve some notoriety in just a short period of time that he was living here. There was often parties late on into the night and the local constabulary had to be called. And in fact, one evening, there was a, a, a young lady who was attacked in one of the closes near here. And it was only her screaming that forced the attacker to run away. And the attacker was, uh, did answer the description of, uh, of Mr. Burke. Now, not long after that, suspiciously, Mr. Burke left the town, leaving great debts to his landlady from whom he was renting this building. He went off to uh, Edinburgh doing the things which became, he became famous for and after a few months he sent word back to his landlady that he was prepared to pay her the money he, he, uh, she was due if she would just rendezvous with him at the head of the Edelston Water, the area which I think we now know as Leadburn area, late one Saturday night. Now the landlady was desperate for money and so she agreed to this rather odd rendezvous place and time and she was never seen again. Nobody knows for sure what happened that night. Some say she just got lost on the moor at the top there and was swallowed up by the peat. Others say that Burke found her, slit her throat and left her for dead. Others say that she got swallowed up by the peat, Burke saw her, slit her throat, and then she got left there. It doesn't really matter. The point is, but she died, and she was never seen again. But, occasionally, late at night, on Saturday nights, when revellers from the hostelries on the high street are making their way through this square, using it as a shortcut, going down these steps to get to Tweed Green. Admittedly, somewhat inebriated, but these reports are repeated time and time again, and have been for over a hundred years. The plaintive, sad voice of an old lady can be heard in here, bouncing off the walls and it's always the same thing which we can hear when are we going to build a roundabout at Leadburn? <laughs> now just bring yourselves up no tour of peebles can be complete without coming to this location this is a recent 
uh, addition to the town, uh, and it's known as the Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> it was in the early 1970s that Robert Plant stepped out of church one day and out onto this the early version of this walkway and made his way down here and as he did so he started humming a tune to himself which in time became the great rock classic uh, from Led Zeppelin uh, which you heard uh, playing uh, as we came up. Um, Robert was a, a frequent visitor to the town and um, in the song there are, there are one or two um, cryptic mentions of peoples. Um, have a listen to the song sometime and see if you can find them. <laughs> Now the, uh, the walkway itself, this is the longest wheelchair ramp in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> uh, it's, made of, it's made of wood, a, a sustainable source. And uh, some statistics for you, there's enough wood in this structure to make 20 million matches. And with those matches, you could construct uh, three life-size models of a London bus. Uh, or a quarter scale model of the Empire State Building. Ooh, that makes me wonder. Yes whether that would have been a better use of the wood. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a talking point in the town. Uh, it's, uh, it's been extremely popular and love it or loathe it, it was the inspiration for one of the great rock classics of the 20th century. Now this stairway uh, has in fact been used for a number of different things, which is often the case when something is built or created for a single use, you suddenly find that it's got some other uses as well. The bridge is occasionally used by the parish church preschool group for bungee jumping <laughs> and sometimes into the cuddy if they uh, were brave enough to just uh, get their head wet before they go bouncing back up again. Two winters ago was a very bad winter you might remember. Now that coincided with the opportunity for the uh, Jamaican toboggan team were looking for somewhere to practice before they went off to Whistler and this indeed uh, fitted that purpose perfectly. Uh, it was also in the running for the bids of the uh, Going Ape, which came to Peebles just recently, but was deemed to be too high and too dangerous, and he went to the much tamer Glentress Forest, which we all know about now. William Chambers is probably most well known to us for his dictionary, the Chambers Dictionary, published in 1872. But what you may not know is that there was an earlier version of the dictionary, um, written way back in 1856. Uh, William Chambers wrote that uh, when he was still becoming wealthy. And in, a, in, in his desire to support local industry, um, he contracted a local uh, people's printer to typeset and print his very first edition of the Chambers Dictionary. Uh, and it was produced right here in the town. Um, 20,000 copies uh, produced, and we've actually got a copy yeah. um, of, of the dictionary uh, right here. The, the three volume so set. Do you see it now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Here it we is. have it the Chambers Dictionary. Okay. <laughs> and of course, when Chambers <laughs> laid eyes on it, he realised that once again he was a victim of Dr. Coburn, <laughs> the apostrophe problem. Which the printer had gone to. Yeah. yeah, the printer had been to the same school <laughs> as Mr. Veach. Yes. <laughs> so, poor old William Chambers was left with a large brick-like pile of dictionaries, completely useless, and he thought, what on earth am I going to do with them? And then he had an idea. And a year later, this building was opened. Oh, we've got A to G over here. We've got H to O over here. P in the corner. Not now, sir. And you'll actually find places where they dug through and found uh, the, the spines of the oh, yeah. uh, of, of chambers. And Umbi didn't, didn't know it at the time, but of course it had these excellent insulation properties. Fantastic. Which makes this yeah. building one of the warmest buildings that there are, and very simple to heat. Yeah. So there you have it. We're have at the it. end of our tour. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, rather sideways look at Peebles. Um, we hope we've informed you. Hope you go home with a little bit more information as to how Peebles works and uh, indeed how we've just made up some marvellous things which you could repeat over the dinner table and try and uh, convince your friends that, uh, that it's true. Don't forget the J.K. Rowling business. So thank you very much for coming. Everybody have a safe journey home. Thank you very much indeed.